on World News Tonight. A new cabinet. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak appoints a new cabinet following the King's request. Tensions rising. Saudi-US tensions continue to rise as the prized energy minister says Saudi is the maturer side of the battle. Split on gas. The EU continues to debate on the implementation of the gas cap as threats of an energy crisis in the winter continues to grow. And an eclipse of the sun. Half of the globe experienced a partial solar eclipse with different countries seeing different percentages of the sun being covered. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, the newly chosen British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak appointed a new cabinet following the invitation by His Majesty King Charles III's invitation from a new government. While some new faces were seen in the new cabinet, it also contained MPs from the old government sparking some controversy. Strong words of reassurance after weeks of political and economic turmoil. In his first speech as British Prime Minister outside Downing Street, Rishi Sunak affirmed that the troubled economy was high on the priority list. I will place economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government's agenda. This will mean difficult decisions to come. His appointment was official after meeting King Charles III at Buckingham Palace and he inherits a dire economy fueled by soaring inflation, a war in Ukraine and a party at its lowest level of popularity in a generation. The previous leader Liz Truss only lasted six weeks in the job. Resigning after her proposed mini-budget plunged the value of the pound and caused soaring borrowing costs. And Sunak said he'd been chosen in the role to rectify the damage. Some mistakes were made. Not born of ill will, or bad intentions. Quite the opposite, in fact. But mistakes, nonetheless. And I have been elected as leader of my party and your Prime Minister, in part, to fix them. The new Tory PM also unveiled his reshuffled cabinet on Wednesday, appointing his ally Dominic Raab to Deputy PM and Justice Minister, and Jeremy Hunt retained his role as Chancellor. In what many consider a gamble, hardliner Suella Braverman was restored to Home Secretary after quitting just days ago due to breaching the ministerial code. Sunak and Hunt are expected to announce the government's next budget on October 31st. Italy's new far-right-led government of Premier Giorgia Meloni easily won the first of two required confident votes in the parliament by a comfortable margin. Italy's first woman prime minister vowed to steer the country through some of the hardest times since World War II and to maintain support for Ukraine in its conflict with Russia. A new chapter for Italian politics, but no burning books or bridges. Giorgia Maloney presented her government's agenda to the Italian parliament on Tuesday, seeking to reassure nervous international partners that despite her party's post-fascist roots, she will remain a solid partner for both the EU and NATO. I have never had any sympathy or felt any closeness to undemocratic regimes, for any regime, including fascism. I have always considered the racial laws of 1938 as the lowest moment in the history of Italy, a disgrace that will mark our country forever. The 45-year-old Prime Minister, Italy's first woman to ever hold the post, has been sharply critical of European mainstream politics. She surprised her coalition partners by meeting with Emmanuel Macron on Sunday night, as the staunch pro-EU French president was in Rome for a peace summit. And those coalition partners, former Interior Minister Matteo Salvini of the Far Right League and Silvio Berlusconi of Forza Italia have both been close with Vladimir Putin. She is hoping to renegotiate several points with the EU from the country's share of European recovery refunds to taking a harder line in stopping migrant boats from crossing the Mediterranean Sea from North Africa. Her government's programme won a vote of confidence in Italy's lower house of parliament on Tuesday. It will be put to another vote in the Senate on Wednesday. 
Saudi Arabia's energy minister Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman said that some countries were using their emergency oil stocks to manipulate markets when their purpose should be to mitigate any shortages of supply. A warning from Saudi Arabia's energy minister appeared aimed at U.S. President Joe Biden on Tuesday. Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman accused countries of using their emergency oil reserves to, quote, manipulate energy prices rather than helping with shortages of supply. His remarks come after the Biden administration recently announced plans to sell an additional 15 million barrels from America's strategic petroleum reserve by year's end as it tries to curb high gasoline prices in the wake of production cuts from OPEC. People are depleting their emergency stocks, yes. had depleted it, used it as a mechanism to uh, manipulate markets, while it is profound purpose was to mitigate shortages of supply, be it as it may, it's everybody's choice. However, however, it is my profound duty to make it clear to the world that losing emergency stock may become painful in the months to come. Relations with the United States deteriorated earlier this month when the OPEC plus group of oil producers, of which Saudi is the de facto leader, decided to cut output, prompting the Biden administration to warn there would be consequences for U.S. ties with Riyadh. The two traditional allies' relationship had already been strained by the Biden administration's stance on the 2018 murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi and the Yemen war, as well as Riyadh's growing ties with China and Russia. The prince said Saudi Arabia had chosen to be, quote, the mature party when asked about how to get the energy relationship with the U.S. back on track. The remarks came at the kingdom's yearly Future Investment Initiative Forum. Despite tensions, the three-day event saw a big turnout from American executives as it kicked off on Tuesday. J.P. Morgan's CEO Jamie Dimon spoke at the conference and voiced confidence that Saudi Arabia and the United States would safeguard their 75-year-old alliance. No Biden administration officials were visible at the forum on Tuesday. Jared Kushner, a former senior aide to then-President Donald Trump, who had since won a $2 billion Saudi government investment for a new firm, was featured as a front-row speaker. South Korea's first vice foreign minister held talks with his American and Japanese counterparts. Their mutual concerns and interests, including Japan's wartime force labor and North Korean provocations, were among items discussed. The first vice foreign ministers of South Korea and Japan met once again, this time in Tokyo, to discuss the legal aspects of implementing the South Korean Supreme Court's ruling on Japan's wartime force labor. During their 90-minute long talks on Tuesday, South Korea's Cho Hyun-dong reportedly stressed the need for a sincere response from related Japanese firms when it comes to apologizing to the Korean victims. However, no specific solution was on the discussion table, such as a plan for an independent foundation to pay compensation to the victims. The two neighboring countries have been revitalizing talks on various diplomatic levels in the light of the summit between their leaders on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly in New York last month. Nothing is being decided because consultations are necessary until the very end. But there is a possibility that we will do so, so we will discuss it with that in mind. According to Japan's foreign ministry, the two diplomats also agreed on a continuing close communication between the two countries over North Korea's recent spate of provocations. North Korea issues also topped talks between Joe and U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman earlier in the day, where cooperation on security was reaffirmed. The DPRK needs to understand that the United States' commitment to the security of the ROK and to Japan is ironclad and we will use the full range of U.S. defense capabilities. Joe and Chairman will meet again on Wednesday to hold trilateral talks with their Japanese counterpart Takeo Mori. 
now shifting focus to the war in Ukraine, saying that there is no time to waste. European leaders stress that the international community must help Ukraine quickly rebuild its critical infrastructure and ensure the country's post-war recovery. EU leaders called for the need to begin working on what Germany described as a, quote, new Marshall Plan for the rebuilding of Ukraine. So that's what, it is, what is at stake here, nothing less than creating a new Marshall Plan for the 21st century, a generational task that must begin now. The Marshall Plan was a U.S.-sponsored initiative that helped revive Western European countries after World War II. The remarks were made at a conference on Ukraine's reconstruction held Tuesday, hosted by the EU Commission and Germany, the current holders of the G7 presidency. They stressed that they need to discuss how to sustain the financing of the recovery, reconstruction and modernization of Ukraine, a process that would last for years and decades. Ukraine, Ukraine needs fast rehabilitation right now as we speak especially as Russia is deliberately leading targeted attacks on civilian infrastructure with a very clear aim to cut off men, women and children of water, electricity and heating as the winter is approaching. The president of the EU Commission explained that the World Bank puts the cost of damage to Ukraine so far at around 349 billion U.S. dollars, adding that this is more than what a single nation or a union of nations can pay for. She then called upon the rest of the international community, including the U.S., Canada, South Korea and Australia, to join hands. In attendance at Tuesday's conference were experts and representatives of numerous international bodies who said the reconstruction must begin now, despite the fact that the war is still ongoing. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with Mobile News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, EU countries want to make sure a gas price cap could not threaten the security of supplies or lead to an increase in gas consumption, following the monetary union's move to introduce a cap on the consumption of LPG. Gas prices in Europe have fallen again. They're at their lowest price since mid-June. Good weather conditions and full gas storage are the main reasons for the drop that will give some relief to Europeans feeling the pinch. It also means some measures that have been agreed by EU ministers won't be needed, at least temporarily. That's the case for the Iberian exception, the cap on the gas used to produce electricity. But EU ministers responsible for energy know that the situation can easily change. The market is volatile. Long-term measures are needed. That was the essence of the discussion on Tuesday in Luxembourg. On the table, a European Commission proposal that includes putting a limit on the price of natural gas transactions. This cap would be linked to the virtual marketplace in the Netherlands, where prices are fixed. The European Commission wants this cap to be dynamic, meaning the limit might change every day. And this competition is one of the reasons countries like Germany and the Netherlands don't want a price cap. Other member states want more precise proposals. Energy ministers will meet again at the end of November to give the final go to new measures that should keep prices under control. Cases of both COVID-19 and the flu continues to rise amongst children in the United States as more child hospitalizations are reported with the lack of space becoming a prevalent issue in most children's hospitals. What they're seeing at children's hospitals across Atlanta tonight, they're seeing in places across the country about three times more sick children than usual. In one location, they had to put up a tent back in August to help process all the extra children. This time, it's not just COVID, it's the flu and a seasonal virus that's especially dangerous for young children called RSV. This evening, five-month-old Bentley Phillips is hospitalized with RSV in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It started with the wheezing. He progressed so fast. His oxygen was so low that we don't know what would have happened if we were home any longer than we were. It's early in the winter cold season, and children sick with respiratory illnesses are filling up pediatric beds across the country. 
In 14 states and in Washington, D.C., they're already more than 80 percent full. In severe cases, the children can't breathe. Really small babies have a harder time in clearing their own congestion. They can't sneeze. They can't cough as hard. They don't have the chest muscles to really expel all that. This is why young kids are at increased risk when it comes to RSV influenza of getting hospitalized. The first thing what I would recommend to parents, which is what I've done as a parent, is gotten my kids vaccinated, right? Because if you can get them vaccinated against flu and COVID, that takes two of the three issues off the table. It also creates more capacity in the healthcare system, and it just makes it better for everybody. Authorities are warning about a possible triple-demic of COVID, the flu, and RSV. We're really tracking healthcare capacity very, very closely across pediatric hospitals. And obviously, if hospitals need help, we will step in and help them uh, to make sure that all kids across America get the care they need. And they want parents to know that 95% of children hospitalized here tonight were not vaccinated for the flu and or had incomplete vaccines for COVID. Long deemed one of the world's few largely drug-free countries, South Korea is increasingly facing an issue with the flow of illegal narcotics into the nation. Citing the soaring number of people being arrested on drug-related offences, the government and the ruling people power party have unveiled a comprehensive set of measures aimed at trying to nip the problem in the bud. The government and the ruling People Power Party will set up a control tower run by the cabinet office and a special investigative body to work on anti-drug measures. During the joint meeting, two sides both agreed on the need to respond swiftly to the sharp rise in drug crime and drug users. This comes just two days after President Yoon suk yeol on Monday called for action to address drug crime in South Korea during a weekly meeting with Prime Minister Han dok su South Korea is no longer a drug-free country. As drug types and distribution channels are getting more sophisticated than ever, national-level measures are very much needed to control the drugs. With easy access to the internet and increased trade on the dark web, drug offences among young people have gone up. The South Korean government is going to mobilise all pan-governmental capabilities to root this out. The new control tower, established under the Office for Government Policy Coordination, will cover all areas from crackdowns, information sharing, prevention to treatment and rehabilitation. A special investigative team will respond to new smuggling methods and distribution. Drug dealers will also face more severe punishments and any money earned from the sale of drugs, including virtual assets like cryptocurrency, will be confiscated. And regarding drugs that are prescribed as pain medication, doctors will be mandated to see a patient's record to prevent people from using the same prescription. In addition, there will also be more infrastructure for treatment and rehabilitation and public campaigns to raise awareness of the dangers of drugs. Trade union is gathered in front of the European Parliament accusing the transport and delivery giant Uber of unfairly influencing the workers' rights of the platform's employees. Digital platform workers and their rights are still at the centre of an EU-level debate. And unions say they are worried about the influence of lobbyists. Last December, the European Commission proposed a new directive on platform workers' rights. And on Tuesday, a demonstration was held outside the European Parliament aimed at protesting the strong lobbying activity made by platforms like Uber. More than 100 people from different European trade unions took part in the demonstration. One of their points is that Uber increased its budget for lobbying from €50,000 to €750,000 over the last eight years. According to the so-called Uber Files revelations, the US-based company co-opted MEPs, European Commission staff and national representatives at the highest level. On Tuesday, a hearing was held by MEPs to assess the influence of Uber and other similar platforms on EU policies. All this was explained by Mark McGann, the company's former chief lobbyist turned whistleblower. When politicians tried to stop us or slow us down, we co-opted democracy itself by leveraging consumers' political power, putting very public pressure on elected officials to back off, drowning them in millions of writer petitions. We told politicians that we would agree to stop the controversial, illegal Uber pop service if they changed the law in the way that we wanted. 
We weaponized our drivers and we weaponized our customers. He also said that scientific research that was presented to European lawmakers was not properly independent. When I was at Uber, we paid academics to use skewed data sets to produce numbers that favored Uber's position. The data would show high earnings because the data didn't take into account the time that the drivers were waiting between one trip and another. The EU's anti-fraud agency, Olaf, is also investigating the case of Neely Crows, the former EU commissioner who allegedly lobbied on behalf of Uber during her calling off period when ex-commissioners are supposed to remain neutral. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Adidas ended a partnership that helped make the artist Kanye West a billionaire but ultimately couldn't survive a mountain outcry over the rapper's offensive and anti-Semitic remarks. Taiwan's foreign minister said that China is likely to ramp up its attacks and threats towards the self-ruled island especially in the diplomatic field. A cargo craft loaded with supplies lifted off from Kazakhstan to the International Space Station. The cargo ship is loaded with three tons of food, fuel and supplies and is expected to dock after a two-day trip. Medibank, private Australia's biggest health insurer, stated that a cyber attack had compromised the data of all of its nearly 4 million customers. Students hosted a vigil for Masa Amini amid widespread unrest in Iran. Attendees stood in solidarity with Iranians and called on the university to formally acknowledge the protests. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with visuals of yesterday's partial solar eclipse witnessed by most of the countries east of the Greenwich Meridian line. Stay safe and have a good night.